<clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, today is the birthday of uh, Joseph uh, Kleikus. Uh, and uh, I will read, as I said, the, the text I wrote <clears throat> in, uh, you know, more than 25 years ago uh, in response to his lecture at Columbia University. Apropos, uh, and here is another mistake. I mentioned already that I so-called edited uh, wrongly the, the word uh, black, but I mean referring to a, to a famous um, uh, North American dancer. But now I notice that I should have corrected apropos because in English is written in, uh, you know, there is no spacing between A and P. Anyway. I apologize for certain, um, uh, you know, uh, mistakes having to do with the editing of, of the text. And I begin. Apropos of Joseph Kleichus' lecture, poetry requires something enormous, barbaric, and wild, said Diderot. Poesia quia regule, said Kleichus. And yet he himself, Kleichus, needed to pay homage to Josephine Baker the black dancer who took France by storm with her so-called barbaric poetry. As a whole, the lecture was very low key to say the least, but all of a sudden a barbaric image, so-called barbaric image was shown to us, a desolate quarter in Berlin with burned down buildings reminding us of war. I wrote quickly in my notebook, life again, life there, there was more life in the death of those images than in the regular uh, of his poesia. After showing us pictures of serene museums, one after the other, regular and deadly, the image of Josephine Baker, vital and sinuous, and the image of East Berlin urban remnants, reddened by fire and decay, came like a much desired so-called refreshment. And yet we cannot disconsider the seriousness of this German architect. I agree with many of his thoughts. I agree when he says, I quote, the etymology of poetry is linked to doing. It is something that evolves, evolves through a specific activity and thereby leads to the authentic work. I agree when he says, I quote again, I hate buildings that must be cleaned all the time. I prefer a weathered surface, one that develops a patina. I agree when he says, both the program and the site have a great significance for me. Two central preoccupations of my work are purpose and location. And I agree with when he says, I quote, talent is the most dangerous thing you can have in architecture and art. If you have talent, you must fight it every day. End of quotation. I love this quotation. I really do. And I, 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 I'll read it again. Talent is the most dangerous thing you can have in architecture and art. If you have talent, you must fight it every day. I think we should all remember what he said, because it is true. And what he said connects with what Frank Lloyd Wright said. Frank Lloyd Wright said, talent is good, practice is better, passion is best. So obviously Frank Lloyd Wright didn't, didn't value too much talent either. It is good, but it's not more than good. And indeed it is dangerous because if you rely on talent, you, you fall asleep on, uh, on its shoulders, so to speak, and you let the talent carry you, carry you but you do not progress. So uh, Joseph uh, Kleichus was totally right. Ta talent is indeed very, very dangerous. How many people today forget that poetry is linked to doing? How many forget that materials which do not so-called age naturally are just frivolous because they do not imply time? How many ignore the program and the site in quest for just another little scandal? And how many trapped in the facility of their talent repeats themse repeat themselves over and over again, producing works without substance? But questions remain. Why did Joseph Gleichus show us a picture of Caspar David Friedrich's The Cross in the Mountains and simultaneously pictures of German architecture from Frederick Gilly 
to Carl Friedrich Schinkel. In what way Romanticism met Classicism and in what way, way both might be relevant today? I am sure many things could be learned from this man, Joseph Gleichus, but I am afraid one thing cannot be learned from him, to dance. For that, as he himself did, we must turn to Josephine Baker, to that black dancer of immense vitality, finding sophistication at the very core of so-called barbarism. And we must turn also, if we want to learn to dance, at that fragment of decayed urbanism shown in the picture with East Berlin before the intervention of the restorative architect. I remember a thought Louis Kahn had. Comparing painting and sculpture with architecture, he said that an artist, in order to represent the futility of war, might picture the wheels of the war machine square, while the architect has to make them round. Architecture has limits, he said, while painting and sculpture do not have to concern themselves with the problem of, let's say, gravity. Perhaps the example chosen by Khan is not the right one. Perhaps in the case of war, the architect should use square wheels too, or refuse to work altogether. But the point he wanted to make is that architecture finds its limitlessness inside, as he inferred, the invisible walls of its own limits. In other words, architecture can, or better said, must dance or sing, but only implicitly, only inside the perimeter of the invisible walls of its own limits. But isn't it so with all the arts? Doesn't the, the rope dance become relevant exactly because of gravity, because of its virtual terror, capable any time to become so-called practical? It is only the fear the to fall which justifies, in the end, the courage to fly. And flight, in its wholesome meaning, is simply not possible in a so-called non-gravitational age. A building with wings is simply ridiculous, inasmuch as Josephine Baker, so-called in space, is ridiculous. Because in space, everybody could be a Josephine Baker, and being so, nobody. Any human achievement is measured against a limit take away that limit and it becomes instantly irrelevant. In this context, and in a larger sense, Emil Choran was right when he said that only when enslaved by the gods, man was creative. Free from them, he became sterile. Why do I talk about flight or dance or singing in connection with Joseph Kleifus? Because while he's right in underlining the, the limit, purpose and location, he is wrong in paying homage to Josephine Baker as in his Kant Dreieck building by placing on top of a Cartesian structure a big, I quote, a big coxcomb of rivet, riveted sheet metal that crowns the building and turns in the wind. This kinetic coxcomb is a device which tries to enliven an otherwise dead building. It is a trick used in order to avoid the great difficulties in making a building move or fly or dance or sing without literally moving or flying or dancing or singing. It is in the nature of architecture to move without moving, to fly without flying, to dance without dancing, to sing without singing. For this to happen, no moving legs, flapping wings, flapping wings, or shouting mouths are necessary, but a moving spirit, a flying spirit, a dancing spirit, a singing spirit. As a whole, Joseph Kleichus' architecture is a morose one, but its darkness is not the blackness the monk by the sea faces in another famous painting by Gaspar David Friedrich, and in his case, the cross in the mountains, <clears throat> though present, seems to be either without shining sun rays or without so-called somebody crucified on it. But a quest, a serious one, cannot be denied. So with this, uh, I ended uh, my, uh, my uh, reaction to his, um, uh, to his uh, uh, presentation, his lecture at Columbia University. And now I begin the... Um, 
the PowerPoint presentation I prepared for today. So uh, he died in 2004. Uh, at, uh, he was uh, 71 years old. And uh, Germany lost an important architect. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we can learn things from him. Maybe not so much to fly, but uh, other things. So he was born uh, on, uh, on uh, June 11th, 1933, and died in August 2004. He was a German architect most notable for his decades-long contributions to the critical reconstruction of Berlin. His design approach has been described as poetic rationalist. I like uh, this oxymoron, poetic rationalist, and I think it is correct. In his best works, he was indeed a, a, a poetic uh, rationalist. Uh, and uh, I also like uh, what is uh, denoted by the words critical reconstruction, because I think his way of contributing to the architecture of Berlin after the war was the correct one, you know, without flamboyance, uh, 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 stern architecture in a way, uh, but, uh, um, uh, you know, because it was it was normal for the city to 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 be reborn, but but with that critical uh, stance or dimension which is mentioned through these words, critical reconstruction, and maybe we can use a similar um, attitude, uh, not just vis-a-vis uh, -vis a city like Berlin, but maybe reconstruction could incorporate or could include a critical dimension. Uh, critical towards uh, who knows what, you know, even, uh, you know, the excesses of our time, you know, the consumerist excesses of our time. How could you be critical when paradoxically you are also serving that um, age of excess? And um, anyway, there is much to say, but please consider that his work was, um, was, was uh, uh, praised as being um, you know, having a critical dimension and on the other hand, having a, a poetical dimension. And that's why his work uh, was described as poetical, uh, uh, poetic rationalism. This, this was the man, Professor Clychus. Uh, and uh, I was a little bit surprised that uh, Bernard Chumi, who was uh, leading um, Columbia University invited someone like him because he didn't represent, you know, the uh, the aesthetics of and the attitude of, of, of the architects associated uh, explicitly with uh, with Bernard Chumi, you know, like like the deconstructivist. In a way, he he appeared to be almost the opposite, but this testifies about the. Uh, on one hand, the, the objectivity, and on the other hand, the complexity of Bernard Chumi. He invited even people who didn't advocate what he seemed to advocate, or or some of his uh, uh, colleagues in um, in deconstruction. Uh, another picture of him, uh, and uh, I don't know how many people pay homage to him today, but we do. Also, we learned that an, uh, another German architect uh, died uh, the other day, um, uh, Gottfried Böhm, who received the Pritzker Prize. And he is also, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, received uh, the title of uh, uh, Dr. Honoris Causa of the University of Architecture and Urbanism, Jon Minku in Bucharest. Uh, a very different architect, Böhm from uh, uh, the one uh, we are talking about today. Unfortunately, because on the, on the British, on the English uh, um, uh, Wikipedia, I couldn't find a list of, of his works. I refer to, <clears throat> to the list published by the German site, the German Wikipedia, but I didn't have time to translate. And uh, so <laughs> I rely on, uh, on your intuitions and mine as well, because I don't know German 
but uh, we'll also understand what the building might be, the function when we look at it. So all the titles or almost all the titles are in German. 1969 to 1980, uh, some, some of the works that, uh, that uh, I mentioned here, uh, I included them in the presentation, but I couldn't find pictures of. So uh, please forgive me for this. Um, I, I was planning in the future perhaps to, to make uh, increased efforts to, to find uh, uh, pictures, um, but uh, for today I didn't for a few works. Anyway, um, his work is, uh, is um, I mean, uh, as I mentioned in the text I just read, you know, he believed in regularity. He be believed in, uh, in, uh, in uh, repetition, in, uh, in, you know, uh, in opposition to Diderot, who, who thought that poetry requires something enormous, barbaric, and wild. This was not Clypheus. But some of his early works, I think, I, I are, are excellent. And uh, uh, even without any kind of uh, curvature, uh, and uh, I, 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 I um, I value the orthogonal qualities and the rhythmicity. I think a good work doesn't have to be flamboyant, doesn't have to be, you know, excessively curved. It can, you can achieve a great architecture also through, uh, um, you know, uh, rectangularity, but also through reticence, through abstaining from excessive expressivity. It, it's possible. It doesn't mean there is no intensity. In fact, Miss van der Rohe uh, um, wrote eloquently about this. You can do a quality architecture, which is uh, intensified uh, in its re reticence and not in its, uh, uh, you know, external uh, uh, exuberance. Now, from 1975 to 1981, he did works for this Neuestheid uh, Wolfen, uh, and I think they are very good. Um, I wish I had more pictures, but you'll see some. Um, it, it's an architecture which does not want to, um, um, you know, scandalize the viewer. It's uh, it's it's an architecture that. Uh, uh, you know, is advocating reticence, and I, I, I like this architecture. You know, and I wish I was a little bit confused because I do not know German. I came across some works; they are not on their website. The, his office still runs some bricks, uh, some some buildings in brick like this one, which were excellent. But I wasn't sure if it was. If, if they were made by him or not, because they were not on his website. But uh, th these buildings uh, in, in, uh, with bricks remind me of the early works of Miss van der Rohe, and I think they are very, very good. And not only with bricks, but here you see both bricks and uh, metal and glass. And they are hybrid, uh, hybrid structures, and, and I think they have uh, uh, significant qualities uh, as, as architectures which are which do not scream uh, their uh, individuality. Even these are excellent, and uh, I, I, I wish for a future presentation to 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 enlarge this one and to find more pictures of this uh, complex of buildings, because I think, uh, in, in a way, I think uh, what he did at that time was more uh, valuable than what he did uh, later on, some, some of the works later on, and we are going to come at them. This is the building that I mentioned in the text I read, that it is in Berlin, and which has, uh, you know, that homage to Josephine Baker, 
uh, with uh, black being uh, spelled with a capital B and not as it was written on the text. And I apologize again, I corrected wrong, so-called corrected wrongly what was uh, actually uh, correct. Uh, as it was said, uh, the adversary of, uh, uh, you know, when, when you try to make something better than what is good, uh, you, 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 you might fail. So this is the building. Actually, I was a little bit harsh, perhaps. The building, even without this moving thing at the top, is maybe not so banal. I mean, this one perhaps is, but, but not this part of his building. Um, it, it is true. It is uh, an idiosyncratic, uh, uh, you know, uh, movable part here, you know. Uh, but it shows, in a way, <laughs> You know, this happens when you are reticent, when you restrict yourself, like Tricus uh, did uh, in the building as a whole, then sometimes you have a desire to get drunk, so to speak, and to, you know, become Dionysian and to become wild. And uh, this is a symbol of that. It's huge. I mean, you see the, the scale of, of two human beings here. This is huge and it moves. And I, I'm glad he liked Josephine Baker. And Josephine Baker was also liked and admired and maybe even loved by uh, Adolf Loss, and not just by Adolf Loss, by else, but uh, who, who, who made a, um, a project for Josephine Baker uh, free of charge, so to speak, but also by uh, Le Corbusier, who I think became attached to her on a, on a trip to or from uh, the New World, from the United States on a, on a ship, yes. There are pictures of Le Corbusier and Josephine Baker. And uh, I should have included them in this presentation, uh, but I didn't. Anyway, this is the building. At least he has some, some diagonals here, which are structural and which uh, animate the facade of the building. But the main uh, spectacle is uh, that thing at the top, uh, which moves and, uh, you know, it, it's a shape which uh, seems to attract him in a few works. So this is in Berlin uh, by Joseph uh, um, Plychus. Uh, too bad that uh, this uh, homage to flight to dynamic forces, to freedom in a way, carries probably the name of uh, some uh, commercial enterprise or company or product, because I don't know what that back of is, but I imagine it's some kind of a publicity. Maybe they paid for, for the movement of that thing, but uh, isn't it paradoxical? You, you, try to escape the, the, the determinism of the prosaic forces in life. And then you display with uh, huge letters uh, the name of, of something which in fact is connected with those deterministic forces that you try to move beyond. Anyway, um, you see even in plan that are some insinuations of the same plan of the same shape the same uh, form that is used at the top. Sorry for the <clears throat> resolution of this drawing. Now we go to a museum in Frankfurt am Main. He designed many museums uh, and uh, we'll see some of them. 1984, 1988. So this was the, the time of uh, high postmodernism, but he was able to avoid the trappings of postmodernism, not in this work so much, but uh, in other works. It was indeed a troubling, uh, troubling period in architecture and maybe not just in architecture because 
of the nostalgia for uh, for a past which was not uh, uh, deeply um, digested and um, the effects on architecture were actually uh, devastating in my opinion some architects many architects succumbed to to it and a few uh, didn't but most of them, even Ken Gokuma had did uh, at least one tragic work at that time. Uh, and uh, the others also, James Sterling also, from a good modernist architect, he became a, um, you know, lamentable postmodern architect in some works. Now, uh, this is uh, another museum, 1986, 1989. Uh, I think uh, Joseph uh, or Joseph uh, Kleichus uh, was good when he employed uh, simple uh, forms, um, you know, almost archetypal. Uh, and, uh, you know, he uh, avoided again the, the trappings of historicism. He didn't build this building, this building existed. So he just uh, worked inside the building. But his, uh, you know, uh, contribution to, <clears throat> to this uh, museum, I think is, uh, is acceptable, you know. Uh, maybe it's not uh, a, a contribution that exalts one, but, but still I think is, is not bad. And it, it has a level of, of, of newness in relation, in dialogue with the existing building. Another museum, 1986-1989, again, uh, having to do with an existing uh, building, an existing context. And uh, of course, the building was not designed by him, but, uh, you know, he, he did some interventions inside the building. Uh, what can we say? You know, it's, it's usual, uh, you know, uh, museum uh, architecture at the inside, unless you think of the extravagant proposals of uh, one like Frank Gehry, but uh, most museums do not have the resources and the ambitions to, you know, uh, create a, a wow uh, reaction. 1987-1989, uh, another uh, another museum, an architectural museum, uh, and uh, it's good. It's you know it's a good uh, in a way modest building. Uh, museums usually are notorious for uh, promoting extravagant uh, architectural gestures. But they don't need to uh, actually, you know, uh, you can make a reticent uh, building for uh, this function that that works very well. Now, not everything is reticent, but um, uh, it's still a, a you know, a, a moderate uh, architectural expression at the most. Uh, for me, I, I would have even preferred if there was nothing curved here. It would have been more radical if there was no uh, conciliatory uh, the curvature. But um, Avertizare Metro Port Portocaliu, Avertizare 
<laughs> I'm sorry, uh, my, my mobile phone is uh, too smart and began to, I, I should have, I'm really embarrassed by this. I don't like mobile phones at all, especially in the smart. Uh, it doesn't shut up. I have, sorry, I have to go with it in another room. Unbelievable. Sorry about this. I, I really don't know if you like, uh, you probably like smartphones. I, I hate them. I really do. Now we move forward um, with a presentation on, <laughs> they're very, uh, you know, intrusive, these phones. You know. uh, anyway, uh, yeah, another museum, geometry and, and poesis or uh, poetry. This was uh, an exhibition there in this year, actually, in March. Uh, so, you know, uh, six, seven years after he died, still um, he's talked about and uh, with, uh, with this uh, topic, geometry and poetry. And uh, yes, it would be nice if we could uh, combine the two, if we could bring them together, geometry and poetry. Uh, I forgot exactly what this building is. It's another museum, of course, in an existing building, and I think he did a good job. Uh, but but the, build, the existing building itself was not uh, uh, a building to, to leave one indifferent. Uh, it has a beautiful structure, and I think he, uh, with his seriousness, he was able to do uh, something that uh, made this existing building uh, proper, uh, displaying uh, space uh, or house for international art. People stay in line in order to not to get milk like us in communism, but in order to uh, see an exhibition. the idea to transform uh, all the uh, usually industrial buildings into venues for uh, culture and art, I think is a, is a valid one and, and a necessary one. Now another museum, 1989-1996, uh, with an impressive interior space. Uh, again, uh, working within an existing uh, building. And uh, yes, um, contemporary art looks good in, uh, in, uh, in spaces which were not designed for art initially, but were you know, refurbished or transformed in order to ac accommodate um, or invite uh, uh, art. And what we see here, we see people gathered for and around art. And this is the role of art, to bring people together, to bridge, because the, the oldest uh, etymological uh, definition of art that I found was art equals bridge equals God. And maybe here we cannot talk about God, but we can talk about bridging, and that's already a lot. If art can bring people together, uh, it achieves a lot. Because that togetherness that derives from contemplating art is a positive thing to life. And a great antidote against war and other miseries, tragic or not. Germany, after the Second World War, uh, invested a lot, not only on uh, building uh, many very interesting modern churches, but also on transforming many of their old structures into uh, cultural venues. And I think uh, 
they they chose correctly. I mentioned this building the churches and, uh, and uh, creating uh, many spaces for uh, for culture for art because initially art and religion were one or art and faith art was a form of worshiping you worship the deity through art but they became divorced uh, at, at some point in time and uh, they are divorced now but initially they were one art and religion and, and and it would have been inconceivable for an artist in all the times to act outside of the of the um, of the gesture of uh, but it's more than a gesture of of, of that involvement with uh, with uh, paying tribute of, of worshiping uh, the deity whatever that deity might have been or whoever that deity might have been but that was the role of art that was lost. Uh, but uh, still the best artists, I think, continue somehow uh, on, on that difficult road of connecting art and, uh, and God or the gods or spirit. Now he built the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. It's the only building built by Gleichus that I saw with my own eyes, so to speak. Uh, what can I say? Um, I think he could have done better in Chicago. You know, it's true that Chicago was highly, I mean, excessively almost influenced by Miss Van der Rohe. But Chicago also was the place where Frank Lloyd Wright lived and worked and where he built many buildings. It was the, the place where Louis Sullivan lived and worked and built uh, significant buildings. And uh, his uh, aesthetics, uh, I'm talking about the museum by uh, Joseph Kleichus, uh, is uh, ignoring that tradition of, uh, of Chicago. And I, I, I don't think it was a correct uh, um, attitude, but, you know, he expressed himself uh, through his own uh, way of expressing himself in architecture. And you are going to see his, his work. This is the building, perfectly symmetrical, uh, almost bluntly so, and, uh, and grayish and dark. Uh, I mean, in between, yes, there is transparency and luminousness, but left and right, you have this uh, mausoleum-like architecture, which does say something true in a way about the function of a museum, because it's essentially talking without poetry, a museum is a storage space. That's what it is. But, but a museum should be more, should also have uh, you know, the exalting function of culture and of spirit. And here there are gestures in that direction, but not everywhere and not always. So uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a building that uh, in the context of Berlin, I would have understood its reticence, but uh, in the context of Chicago, I'm not so sure. Yes, this there is, um, uh, this staircase is uh, is interesting, uh, is engaging, is uh, it has a level of otherness, and it is publicized uh, copiously. But uh, it is an accident within the within the building. Otherwise, the building is as it is. Look at the plan, perfectly symmetrical, and the sections. Yes, it is coherent. Yes, it is correct, uh, but. Uh, in my opinion, something seems to be missing. And what is missing is exactly the heritage of Wright and Sullivan. That is missing, uh, or some kind of a reference to that history of, uh, of or that architecture of Chicago. It's a building that, 
yes, connects with the European side of the, the Chicagoan architecture that was uh, influenced heavily by Miss van der Rohe, but uh, it doesn't connect with the prior history of uh, the architecture of Chicago, which was uh, and is still very present because of such architects as Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, Louis Sullivan and others, but I mentioned the, the, the main two ones. I don't think this is uh, one of his greatest works, but uh, it was built. I mean, you know, you have this huge head here and this huge sphere, but uh, which you pray will not, uh, you know, uh, move uh, towards these poor human beings here. Uh, it would crush them. Uh, I don't know. All in all, it's 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 a building of, uh, of excessive modesty. Not to, although I almost felt tempted to use an oxymoron of uh, of. Um, excessive modesty or, or uh, uh, almost uh, arrogant modesty, which is not modesty any longer. I, I, there is something about this building that I do not like. Uh, it's, it's uh, anyway, this is what I think. Of course, then you get wild and you get those arabesques there where, wherever they are on the ceiling or on the glass. Uh, because the building is the very opposite of what we see there. I wish it was not built, <laughs> to put it bluntly, and maybe equally immodest. Now this is, a, I just have a picture of this, it's a hotel in Berlin, I couldn't find other pictures, but uh, maybe, you know, when, you know, there is a saying that nothing is accidental, well, Maybe it was meant to find only one picture. I don't think it's a great building. 1993, 1996, what can we say? It's, it's a building, it's another building, but uh, I actually prefer uh, those buildings by Kleichus, which are more sternly uh, um, unwilling to express anything. I think he's at his best when he does that, uh, especially in Berlin or uh, in Germany. 1994, 1996, I couldn't find pictures. This one, I also don't know if I found, no. And now uh, this, this, these are two important buildings because of their location. Uh, in the proximity left and right of the Brandenburg Gate in the, in, uh, in the very heart of Berlin. And um, he, he built one here and then there is one um, symmetrical on the left side. This is the Brandenburg, the famous Brandenburg Gate. Uh, I think he did a good job here. Well, this is what the war did to the poor city of Berlin, you know, and uh, we should never forget such images and we should fight as much as possible so no other war will happen. But I am skeptical that human beings are wise enough to, to avoid war. I hope I'm wrong. But uh, it's terrible. It is terrible. You know, we learn nothing. In uh, the beginning of the 20th century, there was the First World War. Then, 30 years later, another deadly war. You know, and, and so what, what reasons do I have to be optimistic that we can avoid war? Let's hope. Let's hope, though. But uh, uh, there is something, some fatality in the human nature that makes us uh, at times uh, become totally irrational. And this is the result. We should look at this result. Unfortunately, we are not encouraged to look at something like this. Just uh, not too long ago, well, some months ago, I sent to a friend of mine, a young architect who publishes certain, you know, announcements from me on Facebook, because I don't use Facebook, a uh, picture, it was, uh, uh, I wanted to pay homage to uh, something relating to Japan, and uh, it was a picture with the, the terrible effects of Hiroshima, uh, you know, when the nuclear bombing took place. 
and Facebook not only refused to publish it, but also froze the Facebook account of my friend, telling him that um, it was an undecent picture. What did that so-called undecent un picture uh, show? Uh, dead bodies of Japanese people uh, who died because of the atomic bomb. Facebook considered them being uh, undecent. A total misunderstanding, well, more than a misunderstanding, an outrageous uh, uh, unwillingness to, to face the truth. If Facebook considers that uh, the, the effects of the war, this picture probably would have considered undecent too. You know, can you believe it? What is undecent here? You know, it's, it's the, the, the raw truth that war should not happen and that terrible tragedies happened and that uh, uh, countless deaths happened. But, you know, a site like Facebook, which is superficial by definition, that's why it is called Facebook. What is a face? A face is a two dimensional uh, entity. It has two dimensions, not three. It's just a face, you know, and this is how the site is. It, it is promoting superficiality thousands of friends, you know, anyone has thousands of friends. How could you have thousands of friends when it's so difficult to have even one friend, good friend, real friend, authentic friend? It's not real friendship, it's the appearance of friendship. So I, I really felt insulted. Uh, they, they, they froze the, the account of my friend because he published a, a picture, he wanted to publish a picture which was taken from the from the media was in the public realm and it represented a reality, uh, but uh, it's it's hard to face reality like this picture. But we should face it and then fight against war through all means. It's unacceptable to start a new war. Uh, and um, coming back to Clypeus, he built this building here and also on the other side. And I really think he did a good job. I'm not so sure about this, uh, you know, parapet here, but uh, if we can make abstraction of it, I think the building is, is correctly kind of uh, without, a, you know, excessive uh, expression. I think it is better this one here, where the, there isn't that, uh, you know, imitation of a castle at the top. This simple uh, box with these uh, windows, just as it is, I think it's, it's, it's the right kind of building in that context. Maybe this is what was meant by a critical, uh, uh, you know, uh, a critical architecture in Berlin. Uh, you know, the rebuilding of Berlin with a so-called critical dimension. What is critical here is the, the very simplicity, uh, reticence of the, of the box, of the building. It's a, it's a minimal architecture. It's a ground, it's, it's a, a grade, uh, grade zero architecture in a way. It's, it's architecture before architecture, almost, almost. So you see the two buildings by Clychus here and here, right in the heart of, of Berlin. Well, inside there is some sensuality, uh, like uh, we saw in the work uh, in Chicago, uh, it seems the stair or the staircase engage um, uh, engages the um, you know the a certain level of sensuality in uh, Joseph Kleichus as an architect and here is the the you know the model of, uh, of 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 these two houses he built there This, this, this kind of silent architecture, I, I continue to think that is a proper, proper uh, uh, choice for such a context. Uh, it's rather pale, this plan, but you can still, uh, you can still see it.
Now, building from 1997-2001, uh, we already know what uh, Joseph Tricus is about in, in general. And uh, here is another building by him. And I think it is okay, as long as we don't have uh, extravagant uh, expectations. But he, 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 in his farm, he, uh, he worked together with the people from, I mean, his family. I don't know, maybe his son or uh, um, other relative. There are certain, uh, several uh, Klaichuses there. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid they go a little bit even further in, the, um, in a certain direction, uh, you know, after his death. You see here an architecture that is that is very you know gray and uh, regular and uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean it has a certain metaphysical quality, but uh, at one point I hope you cannot blame me too much for uh, becoming a little bit bored. I, I can take it uh, to an extent, but not uh, not beyond that extent. I mean, here, fortunately, we have the green in the courtyard, but uh, otherwise, imagine that the, that green was not there. And even the green is so regularly, uh, you know, uh, controlled that, uh, uh, anyway, 1999, 1998, 1999, Potsdam, it's a villa that uh, is probably used for some commemorative purpose, again, relating to war. And fortunately, we have uh, we have nature, which is always uh, a pleasant uh, presence. The building itself, what can we say? It was uh, probably an existing building, and he just did the the, uh, the interiors. Now, a museum from 1998-2000, another museum, another Joseph Klaikus. And uh, there is a picture which I like. Unfortunately, the resolution is not great. Is this one? In its uh, severity, in its austerity, I like it. But I couldn't find a, a larger, a larger picture with it. And the interiors. What can we say? You know, waiting for something to happen. You know, on those walls. I guess maybe some wild graffiti artist after he drank some vodka or uh, cognac or whiskey or whatever because you know we i mean the room is impressive because of its length because of its uh, um, you know curved ceiling but essentially the job of, uh, of, uh, of rebelliousness is offered to art the building indeed uh, refuses to venture so far and maybe that's good. Some artists like it like this, you know. You allow the artist to get wild <clears throat> while the architect didn't. The building, <clears throat> an existing, <clears throat> an existing building. You see it as it is. Um, okay, another building, uh, a gymnasium this time. Uh, so it's it's for a school. Uh, and another gymnasium, he built uh, several, and you are going to see one <clears throat> in detail, this one. <clears throat> uh, it, has, it has good parts, you know, but uh, it's not an architecture that is uh, uh, provoking a wow, but technologically and technically, it is, is executed uh, beyond reproach, and uh, as such, it deserves admiration. Fortunately, there are other kinds of buildings in the proximity, as you can see on the left. Um, what can we say? Uh, there is a tradition of this kind of architecture. To mind comes Tesenov, uh, Heinrich Tesenov, a very, very good, interesting uh, German architect. And then closer to us, there is Ungers. And they're, 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 you know, you can have quality architecture that is. Uh, you know, rationalistic, uh, Cartesian, uh, uh, reticent, uh, and so on. It's very possible.
another gymnasium uh, and another architecture that is uh, similar to other buildings by him. And I would say it's, it's, it's good architecture, but uh, yes, he doesn't surprise too much. And maybe that's good, you know, not all surprises are, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, beneficial. Although here, maybe it is a little bit surprising, this very tall building and narrow, and uh, there is a ramp. Uh, I imagine uh, it doesn't leave you indifferent if you, if you use this, um, this ramp. Quite large pieces of glass, aren't they? Okay, 2004, 2006, here we have uh, uh, an arcade, uh, commercial arcade, and that's where I collapsed. I couldn't continue my presentation because the meeting between uh, Joseph Kleikus, although he was already dead, he died in 2004, but I imagine the project was already made and it was built between 2004 and 2006. He died in 2004. But the meeting between commerce, meaning, uh, you know, this arcade was a, supposed to be a, some kind of a mall and, uh, and uh, Joseph uh, uh, Kleikus uh, made, me, <laughs> made me stop. I apologize, but I just couldn't continue. Thank you. And let's wish him, uh, uh, let's wish him happy birthday. <laughs>